In today's conventional warfare, air superiority is vital to armies and navies. Aircraft, missiles and airborne troops wage war from the skies. The origins of aerial warfare can be found in the ancient world. Extraordinary kite bombers soared over ancient cities. Rocket-powered missiles preyed on enemy ships from the air. Ancient ballistics experts created the first land-to-sea missiles that skirted the waves and smashed into enemy hulls. And at an altitude of 6,000 feet, this ancient discovery's paratrooper trusts a replica of a 500-year-old parachute with his life. Airborne assault is our ancient discovery. The medieval city was more than just a dwelling place. It was a fortress defended by monumental walls and towers. Some, like the great city of Constantinople, now known as Istanbul, had a series of walls and ditches. Others had single walls so massive they still stand after thousands of years. Attacking a well-defended city was a long and difficult process. Every tactical or engineering advantage was explored and exploited. Some ancient military innovators dreamed of attacking enemy fortifications from the sky. Here in the library of Christ Church College in Oxford lies a 700-year-old book that reveals an extraordinary airborne assault weapon, the kite bomb. This is the first image of a kite in Europe being used as a, an engine of war. In 1327, this book was a coronation gift to the 14-year-old King Edward III of England from his tutor. It had two functions, really. First, it was to excite the imagination of the king. And this was a manual, effectively. The, the whole book was telling him how to be a king. Ancient weapons expert Mike Lodes is eager to determine whether the kite bomb could really have flown. He aims to build one and drop bombs from the sky, as may have been done 700 years ago. He's come to Oxford to examine the original manuscript. It's got boys' toys and yeah. machines, and what could be more exciting yes. than flying a kite and dropping a bomb? Absolutely. I think that must have been... <laughs> this is almost the last illustration, and I think this must have been... When he, when he opened this, he must have laughed. I mean, so thought, this is great fun. Is this complete fantasy? This possibly came out of the Crusades. Possibly he's been talking to old soldiers who said, well, there's a siege machine like this, and this is not at all fanciful. There's some evidence that kites were used in warfare in the ancient East and the Middle Eastern empires of the ancient world had long mastered the art of explosives. European crusader armies returning from the Holy Land brought back more than just gold and treasure. They also returned with ideas, the technology of the Arabs, the trebuchet, cannon, gunpowder, and as Mike and Justin suggest, the kite bomb. Could it have worked, do we think? Well, this particular engine, I, I, I think, is very practical. And it, it essentially is a kite. It's a very large kite. It's holding, as we can see, some kind of device, which may be a bomb. The bomb would have been an incendiary device filled with naphtha or Greek fire, a highly flammable petrochemical substance known to the ancients. Like many petrol-based weapons, it was very hard to extinguish, even with water. They would often fling it at castles in great slings and trebuchets and things in earthenware pots. So it would seem to me that's very likely yeah. an earthenware pot. But, of course, you wouldn't actually want to burn a town down, would you? Well, no, it's the last thing you want to do is destroy the town. You want to take it and keep it. So, uh, largely, this is to frighten the inhabitants of the town into giving up the keys. Many mysteries persist surrounding the kite bomb. Why are there three men holding it? And what is the large, spool-like device they're standing next to? The best way to find out whether the kite and its firebomb would have worked is to build one and test it. Armed with his research, Mike has assembled a team of experts to reconstruct the weapon. My imagination has just been racing, and one can only imagine that the young Edward III's imagination must have raced as well. I bet he tried it. I bet he got some men to try it. But we're certainly going to try it. I really think it's anybody's guess if this thing is going to work. I mean, certainly in 1327, this was just the most astonishing concept of dropping a bomb from the sky. 
Based on their knowledge of medieval technology, Mike's team has recreated in detail the world's first aerial siege weapon. And what I love about what you've done here is you've filled in the 3D bit, because all we've got in the picture is this two-dimensional post. It's obviously there for a function. We know the three men involved, and we can get sort of correlate how much power they're going to be generating. So, I mean, we can get some idea of how substantial the whole thing needs to be. But I think that's what the artist is doing with the picture. With his three men's training, he's saying this is an incredibly powerful I weapon. And he's trying to sell yeah. the power of the thing with the props, with the men, and with this. Martin Lester is a specialist kite maker. But what I love about this is it looks exactly the same as the one in the glory. What sort of surface area have we got here? It's about 30 square feet. It's about 7 foot high, 5 foot wide. The cloth for the ancient kite would have been silk and the wooden struts willow. The thing about using wood and silk is that there's no guarantee that everything will flex the same amount. You need a long tail to help stabilise it and counteract any imbalance in the head of the kite. I'd quite like to see it up there. Let's do that now. What do we have to do? Well, I've got the line tied on. If you were wanting to lift a payload of explosives above a tap, is this a design you'd choose? It is. I mean, you want a nice steady kite, something that's not going to chase around all over the place with the wind. Well, it, um, is, a, it is a very well-behaved kite. And with the long, it's being obedient. Well, the long tail just helps steady the whole kite. And I that's, mean, that's the deal of the tail. Hundreds of years before the invention of modern aeroplanes, it was known that all aerodynamically stable devices require a tail. It's relatively easy to produce lift, but such lift must be balanced by the weight and drag of a tail. The two forces act against each other, but in unison, to give balance. And it makes it look really spectacular too. Yeah. So, is this, do you think, just, just a spool to wind it in when we finish, or could it serve some function? Well, it's, I mean, if, if the wind's pulling really hard, you're not going to be able to hold this by, you know, a couple of people wouldn't be able to hold this. So you'd need a capstan, which takes all the main pull, and then you need little, t you don't need so much tension on this side. If it was going 20 miles an hour, I wouldn't be able to control this by myself. The weather turns and it begins to rain, but Mike and the group continue with their experiment. What looks like a double string in the original illustration has led Mike to believe that the ancient kite bombers may have threaded a second string through a brass ring on the kite. This second string would have hauled the bomb up to arm the device. The bomb casing is made of earthenware. It contains four pints of flammable agent with a total weight of five pounds. Though kites can fly in the rain, there's one weather condition that will defeat every kite on earth. The wind's just dropping too much here for us to be able to do this at the moment. And this obviously would be the frustration. <laughs> the kites are completely dependent on wind. It seems almost moments ago that this magnificent dragon was right above our heads and its angry tail thrashing with menace. And now look at it. Clearly, if we were on a battlefield, Kites are not great, because the army will have gone home before we can use it. But on a city, well, you can just wait for a windy day, and we're going to hope this wind picks up. At last, as the light fades, the wind returns, and the kite bomb can be armed. The illustration suggests the young king and his men would have threaded the second string through the brass ring and hauled the bomb skywards. Then they would have walked the kite over enemy city walls. The release mechanism of this complex machine is a simple blade. The string is cut. The rest comes down to gravity. Look at this! We have got wet, burning sand. It's a light on a wet beach, so this is really going to take out a town. You imagine a medieval town with all its thatch and its wooden buildings. Our kite works, our bow works, our targeting is good. This would be a terrible terror weapon. The kite could have held an entire city to ransom as the shocked inhabitants recoiled in horror. Whether the kite bomb was ever used in warfare is not recorded. But this ancient airborne assault weapon certainly was. 
It was designed to attack not cities, but ships, and was one of the most successful weapons in an important war. Its secret? It bounced its deadly cannonballs over water, straight into the hulls of enemy ships. In 1452, the Turkish Sultan Mehmet II prepared to lay siege to the great city of Constantinople. Protected by 14 miles of walls, 15 foot wide, the city was thought by many to be unconquerable. This only made the Sultan want it more. His father had besieged the city, his grandfather had besieged the city. All his ancestors had been trying to take Constantinople. He wished to be the Sultan who achieved this great feat. In order to succeed where so many had failed, Mehmet realized he needed to weaken the city by cutting off its supplies. This meant severing its major supply route, the Bosphorus. Constantinople is situated with ideal connections by sea to the Mediterranean, to the Black Sea. So its water routes were vital to its prosperity and vital to its security too. Mehmet immediately put his plan into action. He decides to build a major fortification to cut shipping up and down the Bosphorus. At the channel's narrowest point, he built a castle called Rumeli Hisar, opposite the older Turkish fort of Andalu Hisar. Together, the two fortresses could control all traffic through the strait. To prevent ships passing through, Mehmet relied on his cannon. A familiar sight on the battlefields of medieval Europe, the cannon was a powerful weapon that could fire a stone ball up to 3,000 feet. The heavy artillery at Rumeli Hisar was placed right down by the waterside to fire flat trajectory across the strait. The rest of the castle is really the landward defence and the supply base for those vital artillery pieces. Rumeli Hisar was the world's first fortified gun battery, but there was a problem. Sinking a 100-foot ship with a cannonball from a distance is harder than it sounds. Traditionally, the only way to increase range was by firing up in an arc. If you shoot up in the air, uh, the, the point at which it comes down is the only chance you get to hit the ship. And it makes very likely to hit it on top of the deck and not hit it at the waterline, which is going to make it sink. A clue to how the Turkish gunners may have solved this problem lies in a mysterious eyewitness account. The document describes the balls being fired in a way never seen before. They hurled immense round stones that went along the surface of the seas as though they were swimming. Some believe this is evidence the Turks discovered the art of ricochet. This modern ballistics tactic was employed by the RAF in the Second World War, dropping bombs in such a way that they skipped across the water and destroyed Nazi dams. The tactical advantage that you get from bouncing cannonballs is that you can hit ships with good reliability at extra range. If you can bounce it, you can go a long, a long distance and hit the ship on the side, maybe near the waterline, and you're very likely to cause a cataclysmic injury. But could the Turks really have pioneered this destructive tactic 500 years earlier than previously thought? At an army testing range in Denmark, Physicist Michael de Podesta and artillery expert Peter Vemming are finding out. The key thing that would have made it novel was the speed with which you could project such a large thing. That's unique to gunpowder. You, you can't do it any other way. The, the next thing is you need is a low angle. If you're lobbing it up in the air and lobbing it down, that, that will never work. You've got to be low to the water, good, fast initial trajectory. To investigate this principle, Michael and Peter use a replica cannon from the same era as Mehmet's bombards. The ball hits the water at 300 feet per second and bounces first time. A closer look at the physics shows how the water repels the ball. First of all, if we look at why the critical speed is important, if we take the ball and try and move it through the water, we can see that at a low speed, the particles of water the molecules are moving around and they're getting out of the way of the, the sphere and they're flowing around it. And if we increase our speed to beyond the critical speed, we'll find that the water effectively acts as a solid and that if we hit it fast enough, the ball can't penetrate it at all. The ball continues on its path, bouncing five times over 1,000 feet. If we zoom in and take a look at what's happening at the contact point, 
can see that the cannonball has scored a, a long trench in the water and the water's piling up in front of it. And at the last point of contact here is we're going to have forces acting on it. 